indeed for joining us for this session writing our own manifesto. Um, four first class speakers joining me up here on the panel. Um, just briefly to tell you that, and I'll take them in this order, Nick Dubois, Member of Parliament and Secretary of State of the 1922 Committee, Secretary of State, promoted to you quite deservedly, Secretary of the 1922 Committee, uh, Emma Carr, Big Brother Watch, a fine organisation, um, Adam Menon of the Centre for Policy Studies, and uh, Matthew Sinclair of the market-leading European Economics uh, Consulting Firm. Um, We'll try to stick to five minutes. I promised everyone on the panel will be away by quarter past four. We will have time, I sincerely hope and expect, for some questions from the audience too. So first of all, from someone who will hopefully have an influence on a forthcoming party manifesto, Nick Dubois. Well, that's very generous of you to over-promote me. Um, I think uh, if you rush down the bookies now on the basis of his tip, you'll be wasting your money. <laughs> I'm sure of that. Um, secondly, can I make my apologies? I have to leave more like ten past because I've got a, a quarter past commitment. I really, um, I, it's inevitable we're, we're going to be talking about you know, what a party manifesto should look like in the run-up to the election, just by the title it defines that. But I really want to throw a bit of a wobbly in and say to you, you know, I'm beginning to wonder how much the manifestos actually matter when I look at it as a candidate in a very key marginal seat. And I think there is definitely uh, in this rather, as we're in this rather unattractive state, where there is a lot of mistrust about uh, politicians and their commitments and their policies and what they are promoting, is if you were, uh, for a minute, allow me to be entirely parochial, uh, my job is to see that I also get returned to Parliament, and of course if enough of us get returned to Parliament, and then reform the government. So uh, whilst I hope from a conservative party, for, uh, uh, conservative party agenda, we will see a focus uh, on uh, why uh, sticking to the long-term economic plan is sensible, what it means for you, how it will help lift people uh, from the unemployed back into work, whilst we will see all the, re the reassurance messages that are backing up what's been achieved with a view to what's going to happen. I must tell you, I'm far from um, not interested in those, but more focused on what can I do to cut through in a marginal seat where I have a majority of barely 1,700 uh, to try and make a difference if, for example, the polls don't shift particularly or we only have a narrow lead because anything else and I'm out. So I would raise the question, whatever may be in the manifesto and the mistrust that goes with manifestos generally, how much influence will a local candidate have on their vote? Now, for years I have been told uh, that actually the personal vote was worth only maybe two, three, four hundred votes. And there is uh, clearly evidence to suggest that in the past. But I'm wondering if in fact, as, uh, as we commonly hear in answer to the question, what do you think of MPs? They're all rubbish, basically. Uh, and then you say, what do you think of your MP? You get sometimes, and quite often, a very different answer. A bit like education. What do you think of education in this country? Rubbish. What's your school like? Well, actually, the school's doing very well, and my children are actually performing rather well. Now, whilst I'm not saying this with um, perhaps any uh, sense of false optimism or clutching at straws, it is quite clear that in the most, what has been the most independent parliament, I think, uh, in decades in the House of Commons, that the um, response from the constituency, far from being disengaged, has been extremely engaged with MPs who are, should I suggest, perhaps not prepared just to be cannon fodder, not prepared just to follow the whip blindly, unless, of course, it's a manifest, manifesto commitment. And one has to ask, will those factors make a difference? Will the character of the MP be important at the upcoming general election? Interestingly, this is not new, because if you look at the evidence of a number of Labour seats in the last election, when clearly they were at a very unpopular time, you will find that a number of uh, names, some well known, some uh, less known, were achieving swings locally of up to 12% uh, when in fact the actual average swing was far from that, some eight points out. Now that's far more than three or four hundred votes. And if you then look at uh, down that list of MPs 
and you look at how effective they have been campaigning locally, what differentiators they're put in, one is beginning to ask, is our electorate, as they lose faith in the wider party political system, where they argue there is little difference between the parties, are they perhaps turning to look at the candidate a little bit more than we anticipate? My belief is they are, uh, and my reason for arguing that is not only evidence of the 2010 election, but I believe it's coming down to uh, the, the, the fundamental issue of uh, will this person actually put my interests or the constituency interests first? Will he be first country, then constituency, and finally party? And I think we're going to see in this general election wider swings than we've ever seen before. That prediction, I'm prepared to go down the bookies and make a bet on. <laughs> what I'm not prepared to go down the bookies and make a bet on is whether it will make any difference in my seat. And I urge you not to take the fact that I'm suggesting this will happen as belief in it will necessarily happen to me and to keep your hands in your pocket and don't open your wallet. <laughs> Nick, thank you very much indeed. Emma Carr. Thanks, Alex. So, as I said, I'm from Big Brother Watch, and I'm very happy to come speak about um, what should be in the manifesto. And that's because I've been spending uh, most of the summer at Big, Big Brother Watch writing our manifesto. And not only is that involved um, writing uh, the ten points that we think should be featuring in all of the parties' manifestos, but also doing an audit of the 2010 manifestos and the coalition agreement to see what was promised, what's been achieved, what's partially been achieved, and what more could be done. And so that's going to be published in the back end of October, beginning of November, to mark Big Brother Watch's fifth anniversary. Um, and Alex was uh, notoriously our first director and did wonderful things, so it's, it's fantastic to see how far the, uh, the uh, organisation's gone. So I'm going to briefly list the ten areas that we think should be featured in all of the manifestos, but I'm only going to talk about two, uh, just, just for brevity's sake. So, uh, surveillance transparency, data protection, CCTV and surveillance camera systems, powers of entry, control or counter-terrorism strategy, social media law, online censorship, a digital bill of rights, data retention and investigatory powers, and finally the Internet of Things. So what I'm going to briefly talk about today are uh, surveillance transparency and the Internet of Things. So, I don't think it'll come of a shock to any of you that surveillance transparency has been a hugely on Big Brother Watch's agenda, especially over the last 18 months. And we've always promoted surveillance transparency, whether we're talking about CCTV, stop and search, um, but much more uh, broadly since um, the Snowden revelations. And we, uh, we along with the um, Don't Spy On Us Coalition, which is a coalition of civil society groups, uh, are firmly trying to put this on the political agenda as well. We think that the reaction to, to Snowden, certainly in this country, has been very weak. Whether, whatever you think of um, Snowden and his actions, I think it's firmly put some questions on the table about what the accountability and transparency of the security services we have in this country, whether the legislation that we have is fit for the digital age, or was it created at a time when the internet wasn't really in existence, Google and Facebook were still uh, in a garage or a startup. So is this something that we need to, to, need to look at? So I have a few policy recommendations around that, um, and we're very pleased to see that um, although we put these in uh, consultation uh, uh, documents, um, these have also been policy recommendations proposed by uh, organisations like um, the Home Affairs Select Committee and um, Yvette Cooper as um, Shadow Home Secretary as well. So firstly, um, we would want to see a review into the commissioner system. I'm sure most of you don't know how many commissioners we actually have when it comes to uh, surveillance and, and things like CCTV and biometrics, but we have quite a few. And unfortunately, unlike their counterparts within the United States, most of them are part-time and most of them only have one or two members of staff. If you, um, if you compare, for instance, the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee in this country compared to their counterparts in the US, the, the funding and the team is substantially less in this country. And so our question is, when they have such a huge job to do, when they are dealing with organisations like GCHQ, which are dealing with more and more data on a day-to-day -day basis, 
how are they supposed to do their job and do it properly if they're not being given the time and the resources to do that? I think that's some, not something that should be an afterthought on part of the government. And it's something that I think needs to be looked into. And as you can imagine, I think the commissioners and those committees themselves are pretty uh, uh, positive in terms of that policy recommendation as well. Um, secondly, we also think there should be a review into any reform of the Intelligence and Security Committee. Um, I don't just say this because I'm giving evidence to the ISC in October and I want them to be nice to me. But um, I think it's, uh, as, as a committee, we, we have a few recommendations, and again, this has been also proposed by the Home Affairs Select Committee themselves. Um, we do think the ISC should be a full parliamentary select committee, um, as well as uh, the Home Affairs Select Committee, it's also been proposed by the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Um, we also think it should be chaired by a member of the opposition um, who's had limited prior contact with the intelligence services in previous posts. Um, and we also, as I said, we think the committee should be adequately staffed and resourced. Um, we, the, the other thing that we, we do grapple with is the fact that the, um, the Prime Minister has the ability to redact their reports before they go into the public domain. And that's the same with the commissioners as well. We think if these people have been uh, put into a place where they're the ones giving their recommendations on, on any uh, improvement that needs to be seen within the agencies, then that should be their recommendations and that's what the public should see. They themselves are very experienced people who know the legality of what they're doing. Um, I don't think it should be uh, the Prime Minister who should then be able to redact that, certainly before Parliament has seen it as well. Um, so finally, I'll go on to the Internet of Things. Um, um, this is something that's less known by a lot of people. It's a term that's starting to be used more and more, certainly within the media. But put it very bluntly, it's, it's things like smart meters, wearable tech. It's the things that link our everyday actions uh, into the standard things that we'd see as being uh, part of our daily routine. So being able to turn on different settings of your fridge freezer from your mobile device and things like that. And one of the things that we're very concerned about at Big Brother Watch is that we think that the power is still not in the hands of the individual, in the hands of the consumer. So we want to see things like privacy policies, which are thousands of words long, sometimes longer than Einstein's theory of relativity or, or Hamlet. Um, we want to see those taken into a digestible uh, format so you can see exactly what data is being gathered, who by, who will have access to it. And so we want to make sure that the consumer can then make an informed choice about whether they want to use that. And a lot of people will. They'll think there's absolutely nothing wrong, but at least give them uh, the opportunity to see that in a digestible piece of information. Um, we also think there should be um, standardised opt-in versus opt-out. I think we've seen a lot of stories over the last few years about uh, people opting in or opting out of something when they think they've done vice versa and not really understanding uh, what, what it is they've signed up to, having to read those one or two sentences over and over again because they can't, they can't quite work out whether what they're about to take is opting in or opting out. I think trying to make that a standardised way so people know exactly, if you tick that box you're opting in and then you'll know exactly where you are and then you've, you've made that informed choice. So I think trying to do some simple things like that to put the power back in the hands of the consumer, of the user, and give you uh, a much uh, better use of your data and an understanding of how your data is going to be used. Emma, thank you very much. Adam Mimmel. So, um, the, under this government, there's been quite a spectacular turnaround in the state of the economy. Seen employment growth being quite remarkable, two million new private sector jobs. The employment rate has been has increased to levels not seen for many, many decades. In fact, the inactivity rate's fallen um, to the lowest level for 20 years. Income tax has been cut, um, and so the government should and is uh, singing from the rooftops about some of these great successes. But there is one key weakness which hasn't really we haven't seen any improvement on under this government, and that is the issue of wages. And so I think that wages and living standards more broadly should be the focus of the next government. Um, and uh, so when we talk about real wages, we're talking sort of about average weekly earnings and, and of course the other side of that is prices. Um, and unfortunately there has been quite considerable weakness, um, depending on how you, how you measure. Um, really, 
the average weekly earnings over the last year um, have grew, grew about seven pounds, uh, grew about three pounds over the last two years, about seven pounds. And if you want to have real wage growth, you need to grow about nine pounds um, over the next year. And it's looking quite unlikely that um, we'll reach that. Um, and people really do need to feel that their sort of earnings are growing higher. It doesn't need to be just in the statistics. So uh, when we compare wages with inflation, we need to look at things not just the CPI but RPI and sort of the questions of sort of household essential items as well. And so when, Mil when Ed Miliband asked that crucial and sort of, you know, the Ronald Reagan question, are you better off now than you were five years ago, for many people, for too many people, the answer will be no uh, in next year. Um, so despite the strong employment growth, despite the fact that the deficit is now reduced by a third and all these other things, many people will feel worse off now than they, will, than, uh, than, than they were um, at the last election. And our real wages are important not just because of you know, the, our ability to buy things that we need and to buy things that we want, but also in terms of uh, the medium term and long term economic stability as well. If you look at the deficit, and, and one of the reasons why we keep on missing our borrowing targets is that income tax receipts have been quite disappointing. And one of the reasons is because wages are growing far less than has been in both Bank of England, the Office of Venture Bond, the OBR and the Treasury have all forecast. And there are many reasons why. For example, during the crisis, people, some people decided to take wage cuts, understandable, and to keep, to keep their jobs. Inevitably, some of that has, has come back again, but there's still, uh, many people think there's still some, some of that which remains. Um, co employer contributions in terms of national insurance, in terms of pension contributions as well, especially after the introduction of auto enrolment. Um, people, employers are deciding to give essentially wage rises through pensions rather than immediate um, sort of wages now. And of course, that, that doesn't mean it's any worse off, but it does mean that right now our capacity for real wage growth is rather reduced. But most important of all is our weakness in productivity. And every year for the last, last four years, the Bank of England and the OBR have told us, don't worry, productivity will rise, we will get back to, to where we were, but they have been wrong every single year. Um, and so I think that we need to have a full frontal attack on this productivity weakness and through that our uh, ability to generate wage growth across all sectors of our economy. Now it's interesting to see that uh, this isn't necessarily a, an entire cross-economy phenomenon. So in finance, for example, wages have been particularly weak, but in, in manufacturing we've seen stronger um, wage growth, but generally across the economy it's been, been quite poor unfortunately. So I think the government so the next government is to look at things like tax, skills, competition policy, regulatory policy, and a real focus on every single thing that they do. They need to have. They need to say, will this make? Is this going to lead to stronger wheel, wheel range growth or, or reduced wheel range growth? So, for example, in terms of the of energy policy or in terms of the green end, the green side of things, many of those things may well be desirable for other reasons. But if they're making us worse off, that shouldn't be the priority in the next five years. Um, in tax policy, the, government, the next Conservative government should make a commitment to reduce the tax burden across the economy, both as a percentage of GDP and uh, in terms of uh, what the median earner in the UK um, has to pay. In regulatory policy, there have been lots of good progress, but there's still a lot further to go to, uh, to make it easier for companies to set up, for companies to hire people, for people to build new uh, buildings and, and improve construction and those sorts of things. So a, sort of a whole new look at planning reform, a whole new look at how we actually regulate our economy and make it easier to, to grow and be more productive and be more, be more innovative. On competition, when we look at energy, when we look at banking, when we look at water, too many of our large service industries are dominated by very big, very bulky businesses, some of which work fine, some of which do not. And we need to sort of have, you know, look at retail, for example. Five, ten years ago, it used to be, we used to say the profits of Tesco, of the, of the big four, are huge and you know, this is anti competitive. And, and now we have Little and Aldi and, and others com coming in and um, sort of taking market share, the, a competitive market sort of working in action, delivering for consumers and delivering for, for taxpayers as well. And um, we need to remove some of the barriers to entry and encourage energetic challenges to come into all of those um, industries as well. And on skills, we need to be 
uh, completely uh, sort of single-minded ensuring that both in terms of apprentices and also universities and um, most importantly on the school level, we, we do everything we can to ensure that uh, we promote educational choice and education innovation which enables young people to when they reach the age of 18, when they get to the choice of whether they want to go to university or have an do an apprenticeship, that they are sufficiently capable to do that and to do well and, and then be productive employees after that. Um, so I'd like to conclude by just saying that you know, when people vote Conservative, they should know that the you know, three things that they should but the three things that they should know when they are voting Conservative is essentially that a Conservative government will make us freer, make us safer, and make us richer. Now, under this government, you can say that it's, it, in many ways it's made us free, it's made us safer, whether it's in pension reform or whether it's releasing people from the dependency of welfare. Now, the focus of the, of the next government should be definitely making us richer. Adam, thank you. And last but not least, Matthew Sinclair. So uh, I disagree with all of the previous speakers, um, uh, but I disagree with Adam very much actually. I just, I'm very wary of when we get into kind of uh, big business and competition. I think, uh, I think it was Adam's right to no, to no cautions about when we get too much into uh, big business as the problem. It's a very tempting thing to do because small business is much more popular than big business and big business often treats us lousily as consumers and things like that. But what you can end up doing, I think, is creating an environment in which uh, uh, windfall taxes become an enormously potent political strategy uh, for the left, and they become enormously dangerous for reasons I'll come on to uh, later. But I don't particularly disagree with them. I enormously disagree with Emma, because I, personally, I love the idea of my fridge talking to my car and recommending products that I'd enjoy. And, uh, and I think surveillance transparency, this sounds like it will make it much less efficient. Well, well, we I think opaque, to get a drone. opaque <laughs> uh, surveillance is the way forward. But I disagree with Nick as well, because I think there is still a role for the a, 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 a very, very important role for, for a manifesto. And I think there's two real functions of a manifesto, uh, and this is what sort of lead me into what I wanted to talk about. Um, I think the first is, it does have a constitutional importance that it's easy to forget after five years um, of a coalition government. The coalition, and this is why I think we should hate proportional representation as I think most conservatives do, is that a coalition means that you throw that manifesto you ran on in the election in the bin, and you come up with a coalition agreement and pretend that somehow has, elect, has democratic legitimacy, which of course it has no democratic legitimacy whatsoever. This has been contrived after the fact. So I think it firstly has an important constitutional role. It will define the behaviour of, for example, the Lords, the uh, civil service. It will be important in defining how they respond to a, the agenda of any incoming majority government. And sooner or later, our electoral system will deliver majorities again. Despite all these foolish defections, sooner or later, this is a two-party system. We will have majorities. And in that circumstance, manifestos are very important. But secondly, I think they're important because they're a test of your ability to distill your message down to a point that it is an appealing series of propositions to voters. Distill your message down to a series of policies they can understand, attach credibility to, and vote for. And I think often the problem is not so much the manifesto, because I'm not sure there are that many people reading the manifestos, but the problem is, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm disagreeing to make the event more interesting. I, I, of course, we agree on everything. But the, the point I'm getting at... bridge talks to mine. The point, I'm, the point I'm getting at is you're... If you can't write a good manifesto, you probably can't run a good election campaign. And I think we kind of saw that with the Conservatives at the last election. An inability to craft a persuasive campaign was very much related in to, to uh, an inability to distill it down to a manifesto. And so if you're bearing those two functions in mind for a manifesto, what does a good manifesto look like? And I think you need, it's striking the right balance between a clear sense of your priorities and why people should vote for you without setting out anything like a detailed program for government. Because that's, don't write budgets in advance. Don't form detailed legislation in advance. You're not going to be able to do it outside, outside government. But you should be setting out the prior, prior priorities. And I'm going to talk on tax and living costs because it's an area I, I, I know relatively well. And so I think I might apply. And so I'd say 
first looks at what the most successful manifestos have done on tax. So um, the Thatcher Manifesto in 1979 didn't say we will adjust income tax threshold A by 2%, income tax threshold B by 3%, etc. It said we shall cut income tax at all levels. Know where you stand. There's no sense of we're going to create a special relief for employers who create a new job on a Tuesday in an employment zone if we like the cut of their jib, which I think has been too many um, uh, Conservative Party tax proposals for the last 10 years. No, there's, it's, you, you, when you, I don't think you need to have a dim view of the rationalising voters for them to think that somewhere in that detail is this won't apply to them. Somewhere hidden in the detail is this won't apply to them. Because it's probably true. It's in order to make the revenue implications less normally. But it's just a load of conditions that mean probably it's a tax cut for someone else. And the people think that the Conservatives are seen as the party of low tax. Conservatives think they're seen as the party of low tax. But they're not. They're seen as the party of low tax by the people who vote for them. Everyone else doesn't see them as the party of low tax. They see them as the party of low tax for other people. And I think that's the crucial thing to understand about tax policy. We don't need to make a load of sacrifices on um, things on, uh, on tax competitiveness because people look at, by reading opinion polls and deciding, well, people like that tax, so we've got to accept it, or they don't like that tax, so we've got to give, give up, up on it. People don't care about a whole load of those taxes. Do so whatever you like on capital gains tax, it's not going to shift votes. But get fuel duty right, get income tax right, get inheritance tax right, and that does matter. And so I think the first thing to do is set out that kind of general principle. We will cut fuel duty. We will cut income Take your choice. There's a lot of good answers with when it comes to tax cuts, right? But a broad set statement of principle on what you want to do with these taxes. But then you need to establish credibility, because the problem is voters have heard those kinds of promises before. And I think the best way to do that is to set out a promise which is very tangible. Set out a pledge which is abolishing something. Fortunately, abolishing taxes is also the best way to simplify taxes. Complicated budgets with granny taxes and all these kinds of things don't actually achieve much in simplification terms. Abolishing a tax, Nigel Lawson's great principle is to do this at every budget. Abolish a tax, every budget. That makes a tax system much more complex, much, much simpler. You're taking a whole chunks out of the tax code every time. And I think uh, there are plenty of good candidates. I think inheritance tax is a hateful tax. I think it's a deeply unpleasant thing to do. To take a death in a family as an excuse to take a chunk of that family's money is, I think, just morally awful. I think that's a good candidate. I think Stan is a good candidate. Because a lot of MPs in marginal seats, like Nick, are in seats in, in um, somewhat, somewhat or in, in moderately prosperous suburbs. I'd say that's a reasonable characterization of a lot of marginal seats. I don't know if it describes your seat exactly. Not entirely, but, but it's good. But, you know, it's good enough, right? Um, and those are seats where stamp duty is a very serious issue. Those are seats where it's not, you know, like the centre of London where, you know, you, you know, a place the size of this table is going to put you in the top stamp duty tier. But it's a place where a decent-sized family home gets hit with uh, 10 grand stamp duty bills. That's the largest check most people will ever write to the tax authorities. And I think the final thing we need to do is take on all of those measures which don't do anything for the public finances, but do cost families a fortune. Uh, I think green taxes are a particularly potent example, because green taxes are responsible for an enormous amount of the pressure that's been on people's budgets. They think it's the cuts, actually it's green taxes. It's also, I think, creating enormous political problems going forwards because pe what people see is, I'm getting ripped off. And they look around for someone to act by wagging with new windfall taxes. But that won't do anything about the problem. It might be satisfying, it won't do anything about the problem. What we actually need is an assault on, this, on, on those green taxes. Then you can leave more money in people's budgets. Then you make everything else you do fiscally easier. I think there's an enormous opportunity in fiscal policy, and I think what it can show, I think, is the right way to approach a manifesto. Clear, simple statements of priorities and tangible measures which people can put their vote to. And if the Conservative Party can't write that down in a manifesto, it will not get it across in its campaign, 
and I think if it wants to win, if it wants to seize the opportunity to not have more dreadful coalition deals at best, then I think that's what it needs to be doing in the next, in the next six months. Matthew, thank you very much. That's four great contributions. We have some time for questions and answers. Um, we've got a broad spectrum of issues from the idea of an individual value of manifesto, robust defence of the manifesto, specific policy areas for whether it be civil liberties or economics. I don't mind which area you'd like to focus on. I just ask you please to tell us your name and keep your contribution brief and ask the same of the panellists. Madam at the front first. Wait, there's a mo microphone coming to you. Marjorie Bayliss, Tiverton and Honiton. Um, Two things, very briefly, Matthew, you don't want to have this business of being connect, having everything connected to the internet because the next thing you know, your local water authority will be telling you you've been to the loo six times a day and don't think that's a bit excessive. Um, but what I wanted to say, <laughs> what I really wanted to say was, Labour are sloping to the left. I contend that over the last 20 years, everybody's been fighting for the centre ground, and because they're all fighting for the centre ground, which has generally been accepted where you win elections, the parties have looked very similar. So when people say on the doorstep, you're all the same, I can understand where they're coming from on this. And I would also suggest that the turnout at elections has, has decreased an awful lot as a consequence of that. I thought the Scottish referendum was great. Who couldn't be cheered by 85% turnout? I would like to see a conservative manifesto based on conservative principles um, and not just something that some poll says oh, somebody in the middle ground would support. Yes, I'd like to see a conservative manifesto, which is probably another reason I'm not, not in the cabinet, even though I was promoted earlier. Um, but, but, but look, I, 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 I'd like to see it, but I also think it's... It needs to be set out not just as a retail offering, which I think is kind of uh, what, what Matthew was hinting at, definitely not the philosophical approach, um, but it needs to also whet the appetite a bit and touch the nerves. So I don't mind a manifesto that says, it's the Conservative manifesto, and I want, to, uh, I want you to have a tax cut. I want you to keep more of your money rather than us lot go and waste it. But I think we should also be a little tactical about this, and. And we should start sending signals at the same time about what type of government we're going to be. Two and a half years ago, I was getting one of my routine telling off from the whips because I said, I would like to see coming up in an autumn statement or a budget a commitment that we will stop taxing people when they go into £40,000 a year because it is not a fair tax at the moment. It is utterly discriminating. It was designed for the for the um, for the wealthy and actually your net take home pay after tax and national insurance is only four grand above the benefits cap i said now don't do it now you cannot afford to do it now but send a direction of travel because you know what that is what people also take into account is the aspiration and direction of travel so i think it's a fine line with the manifesto to spell out conservative but also to make it clear that that's the direction of travel the only second point i come back to because uh, um, I'm, 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 I raise this point. The coalition has, of course, finally given the um, fuel to people. You say, what's the point of your manifesto? And I think it's going to be at least until we have a party elected on a manifesto that can deliver a manifesto. It makes it harder for me to knock on the doorstep and say, this is going to go in our manifesto. They're going, well, you probably won't form a government anyway. And frankly, I don't believe you. We've, there's now two sticks to hit us with. Okay. And uh, the gentleman on the far left, Tim. Uh, um, Tim Newark. Uh, I just want to ask Nick why he didn't uh, mention as a very good example of an MP who's uh, got a strong um, lo personal following mm. as um, Douglas Carswell. I mean, he's been banging on about this for some time, basically, that really MPs need to have a more authentic voice. They can't be just there to voice what the party is telling them and that they can use social media to do these things. And we will be seeing next week whether that will actually bring him victory. So he's the best example of that. Very briefly, Nick. Yes, look, um, uh, D Douglas actually reached out above the heads of all the traditional media very effectively and has developed a following like that. Uh, what I will say is I think you'll see the complete opposite um, with, with Mark, where there was not, a, not, a, not, not that sort of public following. What I'm arguing, though, is quite a bit of Douglas in a way, because 
I, for example, have been quite prepared to go out and try and reach a personal following. MPs are going to have to do that. Thank you. you pass the microphone behind you, please, to the gentleman with his hand up. Uh, Tom Joyce. You talk about simplification of the tax system, and we heard about putting forward general principles. Would not simplification of government in general, benefits, laws, regulations, be a principle that you could build a manifesto around? Matthew and then Adam on this one. Mm. Matthew, sure. Uh, tax complexity is regressive. It tends to be harder for smaller businesses and uh, less fortunate individuals to cope with tax complexity because they can't buy help. Uh, it, tax complexity tends to be inefficient. It means a lot of resources wasted on navigating the complexity rather than just uh, dealing with the system. And I think tax complexity tends to be unjust. Unjust. You, you tend to, but with, in a complex system, people don't know the rules they should be following. And uh, it's, you know, the, there's a, the, the classic tale of the Roman emperor who writes all his, has all his commandments put at the top of a very tall column so no one can read them. Because then everyone's vulnerable. The law can come for anyone if you don't know if you've broken this or not. Um, I think, uh, while I'm not sure about surveillance transparency, I think legal transparency is a very good idea, and that's not going to be possible with a complex system. Adam? Uh, yes, certainly. I mean, I would agree with many things Matthew said. In tax complexity, it gives the impression that the tax system works in the favour of the rich and powerful and against the uh, the small business or uh, the individual trying to sort of set, up their, set up their own business. So certainly there needs to be a lot more progress than that than has already been. On the regulatory side, there, there's been the two in, two in, one, out, so one, in, two in one out rule, um, or one in two out rule now, so, um, which is, there, there's led to some progress, but you can't really deal with regulation or indeed some tax complexity things without also dealing with many of the things that you're getting from Brussels. Um, so when the government says we are reducing the cost of regulation, yes they are, but at the same time the, there's a sort of significantly sort of increase in, in the cost of regulation coming in from the European Union of which we have very little control. Um, so the government should certainly set out some broad principles and say we want to, over the next parliament we will reduce the tax burden, we will reduce the cost of regulation, we will uh, make it easier for, for somebody to set business and, and identify certain things which they can do to do that. But they should be. They should be at the same time be worried that in order to achieve that, they, there does need to be significant reform on, on the Brussels end. Okay. I see no other hand, so I'm just going to invite uh, the gentleman who's just stuck his hand up at the back there, and we'll take two in two in one go. So that gentleman there, and then the gentleman on, on the right hand side. Uh, my name's Mark. Just a quick question on the Climate Change Act 2008, which Ed Miliband introduced and was willingly voted for by literally every Tory MP, give or take two or three. Uh, how are you going to distinguish yourself on energy policy at the next election if everybody's signed up to this economic madness that puts additional costs on business, you know, is, is ruining household budgets, and yet nobody's going to repeal this legislation that Ed Miliband introduced? What's the difference between the Tories and Labour on energy? Man who knows his audience, if you can pass your <laughs> microphone uh, <laughs> towards this side, please. Big society, we're all in this together. Great. <laughs> Derek Cooper of Croydon. Um, I thoroughly agree with the two gentlemen on the right. Um, I hate to think of the manifesto that the other two people try and put together. Uh, it's far too detailed. And uh, this talk about average this and average that. Uh, you mentioned about average earnings going down. You've only got to get a few uh, high-powered bankers having their bonuses cut or deferred, or you've got to have a lot of people um, on a minimum wage who have actually got into new jobs for that amount to go considerably down. Uh, and it's, uh, it's completely meaningless. What you need to do is have something which is weighted so that you can see what end of the spectrum is going up and which is going down, and then talk about an average. Okay. And the other thing I would like to mention is this question, the uh, word deficit, which comes up time and time again. The fact, the, the, what you really is talking about is the annual deficit yeah, yeah. of the country. The, and and the people, a lot of people think that you're talking about the national, total national debt yeah. when you mention deficit. And I think you, it's very incumbent that you 
differentiate between the two. OK, well, thank you, Alex. This will be easy. Climate change, simplicity, deficits, and any closing thoughts in one minute each. And we'll go in the order we spoke in, because I know Nick, you've got to go. Uh, so, first of all, Nick Dubois. Well, climate Climate change, I mean, it's absolute nonsense. We've done more harm by that, and we've undermined more of our beliefs and values with that garbage, and, and it really is, I think it's, it needs a big change. I won't waste more than my one minute on that, because we're going to agree. Secondly, uh, on your point on average this and average that and average earnings, I know that Ed Miliband's going to ask this question, are you better off or not? And, and you know, I'm quite blunt. I'm, I'm saying, well, one of the main reasons we're not better off, mate, is because of, we've been busy paying off your massive debt and we've been trying to reduce your massive annual deficit. But can I also say there's another factor in this, and it really ignores away at me at this, and I've heard no talk about it. The biggest skew in all our earnings in this country, of course, is these working tax credits, where the state is fundamentally supplementing business in order to line the pockets. How on earth are we ever going to sort that mess out? Because that is one of the most artificial interventions. Whatever the good intentions of introducing it in now is a real burden on the, on the backs of uh, uh, on the back of earnings. Now, what was the third one? Now, come on quickly. It was <laughs> about deficits against. Um... Well, I agree with you entirely. It is an annual deficit. People need to understand that every year. Are they surprised the debt is getting more? Because every year we're spending more than we earn. Can we please have back Margaret Thatcher's handbag when she went through the shopping weekly shopping bill? <laughs> So I'm not going to talk about climate change or the deficit because I don't know anything really about those things. But what I will talk about is what this gentleman was saying here about the simplicity of manifestos. And having written Big Brother Watch's manifesto, it really does uh, channel the mind. If you can put your message into a couple of bullet points, which uh, the way I think about it, if I was going to go on the radio and I had a two minute slot, would I be able to fully explain what we wanted and how we were going to go about it. If you can't do that in those two minutes on a few bullet points, it's far too complicated. People will switch off and will they, they will not listen. Matthew's absolutely right when he says you do not have to go about the, the minute details as to how you're going to about, go about doing that. If you enter a government, you have your civil servants who can go about helping you uh, put that in action. But if you can't do it in a couple of bullet points, then you've not got it. That's great. Adam? Uh, so I think on energy, uh, it would be interesting to see the distinction between Labour and Conservatives on shale gas and on perhaps the carbon price floor as well. I think the, um, George Osborne has already frozen that and might, might see some promises in terms of trying to reduce that. Um, gentlemen, there, I'm afraid on the average wages, you're, you're actually wrong. Um, so you're confusing median and, and mean. So when we talk about average weekly earnings, we're actually talking about median earnings. So when a banker has a reduced bonus or when someone, ha someone at the bottom gets a 50% pay rise, it makes very little difference at all to the, what the average weekly earnings. On the deficit and the debt, you're absolutely right. When you ask people, has this government, under this government, has the total debt increased by £600 billion to stay the same or decreased by £600 billion? Of course, they will think, well, this government's been cutting debt, but in fact, total debt has increased by about £600 billion. And I'm afraid Nick actually made a mistake there. He said, we're paying down the debt, we're not. We're reducing the debt. Did I the even essence. use the wrong language? Yeah, I'm afraid so. That's okay, everyone applauded anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Matheson, then. I was going to focus on the climate change bit because it's what I know. I, I, I think it's, uh, there's an, it's an enormous problem because what's happened is. Uh, while you say Miliband introduced the Climate Change Act 2008, and it is a feature, not a bug, under the Climate Change Act, that it sees energy companies make more profit, because they, so energy companies have to invest a lot more, they therefore have to make a lot more profit, they therefore have to charge higher prices. This is how this regulation was supposed to work. And now politicians say, horror! They're making more profit, and there's more prices going on, and I think, and, and, there's, and there's higher prices. But I think the challenge is that the Conservatives have made this worse. The Conservatives introduced the carbon price floor. Uh, the Conservatives, um, uh, and I think it is a, frankly, a failure of people like me that too many Conservative MPs thought that voting for the energy bill yeah. was the right thing to do. And so you saw MPs who were on the right side of this issue voting for the energy bill, voting, thinking that to be pro-nuclear is to support the government signing off on the most expensive nuclear plant in the world, yeah. which they've just done, and which is going to cost us a fortune. And I think, but I would say it's never too late to change. I think that the energy issue is prominent enough that if a party sets out a course for a better climate policy, one focused, in, I think, on research, 
adaptation resilience rather than draconian regulation and, tr and massive deployment of inadequate alternatives to fossil fuels, then I think there is enormous political opportunity there for the party that does that. So I don't think it's too late, but I very much agree that it's been uh, depressing that the Conservatives haven't been able to fight that because it was an enormous sitting opportunity for them. And I think it's, but I think it still could be. I wouldn't say, I don't want to write it off and anything you need to. Well, we'll be leaving this room quickly to let it get set up for the next event, but before that I'd like to thank the Freedom Association for helping yeah. to organise this stimulated discussion. I'd like to thank all of you for coming in and taking part and joining in, and I'd like most of all to invite you please to join with me in thanking our panel in the usual way. Thank you.